April 5th, 1453. The sun is rising on Constantinople, once the largest and greatest city on earth, once the capital of the world's most powerful empire. Known today as the Byzantine Empire, its inhabitants simply knew it as the Roman Empire, an empire that stretched along the Mediterranean from the westernmost tip of Spain all the way to the Red Sea. And Constantinople had been its heart, the center of classical scholarship, the link between the East and West, the undisputed successor to ancient Rome. But all of this is no more. Centuries of turmoil, economic hardship, and threats from outside, as well as from within, have left Constantinople a shadow of her former self. With fewer than 50,000 people, there's no one to live in most of her houses. Of her hundreds of churches, palaces, and monasteries, most stand in ruins. Wheat fields, orchards, and scattered villages have replaced the bustling urban sprawl that was once home to at least half a million. And on this spring day, almost 600 years ago, the people of Constantinople are very, very afraid. Why? Because less than three miles from their great walls, the Ottoman Sultan, Mehmed II, has set up camp. Only 21 years old, Mehmed has already established himself as a formidable foe. When he ascended the Ottoman throne, he inherited an empire that controlled almost all the land around Constantinople, an empire that had steadily established itself as the dominant power in the eastern Mediterranean. And he has spent the two years since consolidating his military power for the first great campaign of his reign. Mehmed is going to capture Constantinople. To this end, he has brought with him at least 60,000 men, 100 ships, dozens of cannons, and tens of thousands of pounds of gunpowder. The Byzantine soldiers are far fewer in number. Their ships and cannons, too, are smaller and fewer than those of their foes. And yet, within the walls of Constantinople, the Byzantines are preparing to defend their great city, as they have so many times over the past millennium. For although many have laid siege to Constantinople, few have succeeded. This is where the Roman Empire will make its final stand. Welcome back to the Weird Medieval Guys podcast. I'm Olivia, and this is Aaron, the world's foremost Constantinople enthusiast. Enthusiast, yes. Expert, no. I'm so glad you used that word. Because <laughs> I'm going to get something wrong. And so I'm going to... I have doomed myself. Because I have been building this up for the better part of a year. And now if I get even a single date wrong, I'm going to hear about it. <laughs> I do know that you are absolutely the most passionate person about Constantinople and Istanbul and the Ottomans um, that I have ever met. I think it's a cool place. So I think we're, we're well situated to take on Constantinople, as Mehmed did, for this special double part episode of the Weird Medieval Guys podcast. I think to tell this story, we have to do a cold play and go back to the start. <laughs> and explain why this city became this, really this hub. This, this this axis on which the the history of the Mediterranean really does turn and why it has absolutely rotted the brains <laughs> of thousands of people, including me and now my good friend Olivia as well. Sorry about that. And, now, and soon you too. But to do that, we're going to have to go back thousands of thousands of years, before the Middle Ages, before even the time of the Caesars. Mm-hmm and tell you about Byzantium. So, according to Herodotus, uh, it was founded in the 7th century BC as a Greek trading post. Now, why was it founded? 
because it has amazing geography. Constantinople, or Istanbul, sits on uh, the edge of the Bosphorus Straits, which are this, it's, it's, it's this little strip of sea that connects the Mediterranean to the Black Sea, which means that it's actually an incredibly useful midway point between getting to the great ports of the Mediterranean and to, and to Eastern Europe as well. It's still, by the way, an incredibly important trading point. As anyone who has followed uh, the course of the conflict in Ukraine knows, it's, it, it remains incredibly important. Um, for transporting things between the Black Sea and the Mediterranean. By the way, if you go to uh, Istanbul, one of the if you fly in, one of the first incredibly striking things that you see as you're sort of descending is literally hundreds of container ships, and they all like and they're all from your from your little seat on the plane. They're all tiny and they all seem to be like frozen in this sort of like like little models, and it's incredibly incredibly sort of awing because each one of these boats is like <laughs> I want to say a kilometer long that's not true <laughs> but it feels like it so anyway point being this is a vital this is from the very first points of recorded history is a vital economic artery Yes, and not just because of shipping in the beginning, but mm. also because of the natural resources that are there in the water. So already in the Greek period, we have some writings that give us some, I would say, very luscious and compelling <sighs> details about just how marvelous this location is. They give us a sense of kind of the gravity of this place. And there's great legends. There's a legend that the Greeks who founded Byzantium were guided there to start a city by Apollo himself. And we have accounts telling us that the Golden Horn, this big natural harbor to the north of the city, was so named because its waters were so dense with fish that the surfaces literally sparkled with all of the scales. Well, this is why... This is why um... Garum, or garum, I actually don't know how it's pronounced, becomes such an incredibly important part of the Roman diet, which is, garum is what, how is it made? It's sort of made by cured fish guts, basically. Oh, they're fermented, yeah. Sorry, ferme yeah, fermented fish guts. And it sort of becomes, I, I, the closest thing that I think, the closest analogy that I think we have now is like, um fish sauce like from thailand that's kind of the closest I thing i think it's it's somewhat analogous and it's... they love this stuff they put it on everything <laughs> oh yeah and there are so many accounts of like uh latin christians coming to coming to constantinople and like this is inedible <laughs> <laughs> so it's a it's a wealthy um successful trading city that sort of brings together I should say, trade from Africa and Asia and Europe. But in the sort of early classical period, it isn't hugely politically significant. Until a little thing comes along called the Tetrarchy. Now, in the 4th century, um, Rome is, the Roman Empire, as we know, is still around. And um, it's the problem is, it's huge at this point. It is, I think that's pretty much, it's close to its maximum extent at that point. It's yeah. stretching from, you know, from Britain to Spain to Asia Minor to, to North Africa. It's enormous. And governing that much space today would be incredibly difficult. Governing that much space in the fourth century when there are, when there ain't no internet is almost impossible to imagine. So they came up with an ingenious way around that. So... The, imp the Emperor Diocletian introduces a just profoundly complex system of government called the Tetrarchy. Basically, the empire will be divided in half, and they will be governed in technically independently, but really in concert, by two emperors called the Augustuses, and each one will be the emperor of one half of the empire. They will be assisted by a subordinate called a Caesar. This is a very complicated system so the way that i would explain it is imagine if you like cut the united states in half down the middle and each half of the country had its own president and vice president and they like pinky promised super hard not to fight each other sounds like a recipe for success oh yes so in 306 uh, a man called constantine becomes the augustus of the eastern half of the empire 
And the problem is that if you're an emperor living in the East, there's not an actual natural traditional capital for you to rule from because Rome is in the West, well, as is the entirety of Italy. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so a, a new emperor needs a new capital and he chooses Byzantium for its, you know, for its strategic importance as the new Rome. And when I say new Rome, I mean that very literally because he starts, he orders the construction of a whole new section of the city called New Rome. New Rome, baby. Which is why Constantinople, from this point onwards, is often referred to as the Second Rome. Not only does Constantine call this city New Rome, but he also sets it up with all of the trappings, you could say, of the seat of power of a Roman emperor. So he builds himself a big, fancy, monumental palace, he has forums and a hippodrome, and all these things that would have been recognizably Roman. Oh yeah, no, it looks it looks like a Roman city. And it, the interesting thing is that it will continue to look like a Roman city well into the into the Middle Ages when, you know, in the certainly in the Western Latin half of Europe, that kind of architectural style really falls out of favor. Exactly. Especially because although at this point Constantine has converted to Christianity, it's I think somewhat debated the extent to which he was embracing Christianity on a personal level. And I so... hard, I am one of the people who thinks he was like a real evangelist. I think he was a I think he was a personally Christian guy. I mean, I think he definitely was later on, I think. Right, fair enough. But I think at the time of building Constantinople, even if he was, he wasn't sort of making big efforts to keep paganism out of Constantinople, and he was allowing the building of new pagan temples, although he built churches as well. And so my point in saying this is just that there was a wholehearted effort to really transplant Rome, even in its pagan sense, um, you know, to Constantinople. And I think that actually brings up a super, super interesting point, because there's a huge tension there. It will be identifiable, I think, through the entire history of this city right up until until the present day, which is that, you know, it is the it is the seat of Constantinople is the seat of the of power of not just the first Christian emperor, but the emperor who formally recognizes Christianity as the state religion of the Roman Empire. But at the same time, um there is this sort of allowance of pluralism. And this is something that will be You'll see it in the medieval period. You absolutely see it in the Ottoman period. And even when you get up into the 20th century and you have these sort of, these sort of, this, the, the really ethnic cleansing of the 20th century, the one place in sort of in, in Turkey where Greeks aren't expelled is Constantinople. I think, I think that really you can see the, the, the trends and the and the and the historical forces that determine the the shape of this city right from the outset absolutely and in the subsequent centuries after constantinople is founded as the christian capital of a christian empire even though at the outset not everything is you know christianity is not yet entirely dominant you know it does become clear that the empire and that europe are becoming increasingly Christian and that Christianity is establishing itself as the dominant force in Europe. So in the subsequent years, we do see emperors continuing to cement this status that Christianity has as the main religion. And we see Constantinople become a very, very important Christian city. So Constantinople, by the, you know, by the fifth century, it is the, the seat of power of the East, but it's still part of this wider Roman world that stretches across, you know, the vast majority of, um, of Southern and Central Europe until <laughs> you oh may have, you may have heard of this little thing called the fall of Rome. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on it too much because that's for a different podcast. And this is a medieval podcast. And we frankly spent about 20 minutes in antiquity already. Yeah. And so I think it's time to move on. The important point to say is that, Roman authority in the 5th century really evaporates across the western half of, of the empire, but it definitively does not in the eastern half. So this, what that does is this leaves a rump Roman state 
uh, centered in Constantinople that has control over, you know, North bits of North Africa, uh, the Balkans, Anatolia, Greece, um, bits of Southern Italy as well. Um, almost, I'd say, definitively the richer and more important half of the empire, um, but still a, a, a much diminished power. At this point, I think it's a really, we need to set something up and explain a, a piece of terminology that we're going to be using a lot in these, uh, in these next two episodes, which, without which uh, none of the, what we're about to say will make any sense whatsoever, which is, from this point onwards, even though we are now past what historians call the Roman period, we are going to continue to refer to the people of Constantinople and the empire that it controls as Romans, because that is what they called themselves. The name Byzantine is a post hoc name that was given by modern historians to distinguish uh, the... Well, no, to be honest, it's a pejorative, I think. I think it's a way of... I think it's a way of taking the... Um, taking the Romanness of this culture out of it. And there, is, there, are, there are reasons for that. Like, obviously, they don't... For most of the Middle Ages, they don't control Rome. Yeah. And, um, and they... Like, the, the language of... The vernacular language and the court language becomes definitively not Latin, but Greek. And a lot of people use that as a pretext to go, oh, well, they're not really Romans. I say it's a pejorative term because I think a lot of historians use the quote-unquote fall of Rome as an excuse to kind of dismiss everything that comes next, the next thousand years, as basically this kind of embarrassing epilogue. And there's a lot of pejorative stuff that set, gets said about the quote-unquote Byzantine Empire. But my favorite my favorite expression of that is from a guy called William Leckie, who's an Irish historian, who he says that he has this withering, <laughs> withering uh, diatribe against against <laughs> the medieval Romans when he says, and I am going to, I'm apo apologies, but I'm going to give him an accent. Of that Byzantine Empire, the universal verdict of history is that it constitutes, without a single exception, the most thoroughly base and despicable form that civilization has yet assumed. There has been no other enduring civilization so absolutely destitute of all forms and elements of greatness, and none to which the epithet mean may be so emphatically applied. The history of the empire is a monotonous story of the intrigues of priests, eunuchs, and women, of poisonings, of conspiracies, of universal ingratitude. Yikes. Lovely guy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What's guy. wrong with the intrigues of women, may I ask? <laughs> yeah. The yeah. intrigues of women have some, been some of the highlights of my life, quite frankly. Well, and we've, we've talked, I think, quite a bit about how the Middle Ages as a whole have had this, you know, kind of identity as the historical... Um, you know, like, as a historical low point, mm -hmm. you know, assigned to them after the fact by historians. And I think this is absolutely an extension of that. And yeah. I think, you know, coming from the perspective of someone in the present day, it feels weird to think of people living within this part of the empire into, you know, well into the Middle Ages as Romans in the sense of, you know, the Roman Empire and the Roman Republic. But two people who were living there at the time, they perceived, they didn't perceive a fall of Rome. They perceived no. a very strong sense of continuity between the Roman Empire and their empire. In fact, they there perceived is no, them as one and the same. There is no definitive break-off point. There, the, if, you experience, if you lived in the eastern half of the Roman Empire, you would not have experienced um, the quote-unquote fall of the Western Roman Empire as this huge hinge point which was a which was a, like a turning point for the 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 destiny of your country or for your own personal sense of identity exactly you were roman you woke up roman on the day that rome fell and you went to bed roman yeah absolutely even if you spoke greek it didn't matter yeah you get some great parallels as well between constantinople and rome um, as cities 
So for instance, Constantine made sure to divide the city into 14 districts like Rome to parallel the sort of structure of government and city layout, and it's also said that the walls of Constantinople enclose seven hills, like the seven hills that Rome was founded on. You know where else is founded on seven hills? Sheffield. Yes, so I actually have... <laughs> this is... Thank you for bringing this up. <laughs> I have a list of cities that claim to be founded, because this claim about... Um, Constantinople being founded on seven hills is it's a bit spurious because it turns out that like in areas where there's seven hills there's also other hills and yeah. so a lot of the time because they say about like, they say it about Edinburgh as well but there's more than seven fucking hills in yeah. Edinburgh so they'll just you. choose like the seven tallest hills and be like oh it's seven hills like Rome <laughs> and so some other cities that also make this claim um, as you say Sheffield Liverpool yes uh, Madrid Moscow oh. um, well Moscow is the third Rome. But we'll get to that. Brisbane, Australia. <laughs> the fourth Rome. Albany, New York. The fifth Rome. And um, Rome, Georgia. Well, you know what? Fair enough. As well as Athens, Texas. Okay. Uh, Lynchburg, Virginia. That Okay, can, can we circle back to that name? <laughs> Staten Island. <laughs> hey! <laughs> and so on. Um, so, yeah. There's... Uh, there's I don't actually have any any uh, point to make about that. Well, no, I think there is a point to make about that, which is that, like, the new... everybody wants to be the next Rome. Exactly. But few actually are. Mm -hmm. And I would say that Albany, New York, is probably, you know, what people, when people think of the modern sort of center of the, the Western world. <laughs> <laughs> you might be wondering if the quote-unquote, fall of Rome is not such a cataclysmic event for Constantinople. Why are we dwelling so much on it? I think the reason for that is because the, you know, shearing off half of the country basically means that Constantinople becomes much more important because now it is the seat of the singular emperor. It's the seat of the singular senate. It is the center of political life and cultural life. And so one of the interesting things, one of the sort of telling things about the place that Constantinople is afforded in medieval Roman culture is that the people's nickname for it um, is the polis, means the city, the definitive article. There are other important cities in the empire, like Antioch or Jerusalem and you know Rome itself when they control it, but the city is an embodiment of the state. And this is also really a really important point to, to hammer home because there's also, not only is the city sort of synonymous with the Roman state in this period, but also the Roman state becomes synonymous with Christendom. Because it's the capital of the, the world's largest Christian state at this point, um, Constantinople becomes a sacred, a sacred city. It's a place that people are going to do pilgrimages to throughout the Middle Ages because people are constantly bringing icons and relics from the different provinces of the Roman Empire, which you got to remember, in the early medieval period, these provinces include the Holy Land. So there's loads of Jesus shit over there. Absolutely, yeah. Um, and so there's this really important cultural change that happens in the sort of, really, I think, in the first centuries of the, of the Middle Ages, which is this association with the Roman state, between the Roman state and the kingdom of heaven. A lot of Roman scholars point out that Christ was born in the reign of the first Roman emperor. And they say, well, that's not a coincidence. That, you know, this is the, this is the kingdom of, Rome is the kingdom of heaven on earth. And so, if Rome is the kingdom of heaven on earth, and Constantinople is the city of Rome, then Constantinople is the beating, spiritual, sacral heart. It's like a, the way that I always sort of like to explain it is it's, you know, that hippie shit about like ley lines and energy. Yeah. It's that. Absolutely. It's the, it is, it is, it sits at spiritual, like the spiritual, the heart of the spiritual ley lines of the early Christian world. Yeah, absolutely. In my mind, I would say like the metaphor that comes to mind when I think of this stage of Constantinople's development is that it's kind of like a worm. <laughs> <laughs> because if you cut a worm in half, 
the bit that has the brain will regrow and become a, a whole worm. <gasps> which half of the Roman Empire became a whole empire and which withered and died? Constantinople is the brain of the worm. Well, there's a, there's a bit of debate it. as to which withered and died. <laughs> So, enough chatting about ley lines and, and emperors and stuff. I think we need to give the people a sense of what you would have seen and, ex and heard and experienced if you arrived at Constantinople in its heyday. Let's go on a journey. Let's go on a journey. So, it's, let's say, I don't know, It's the 10th century, and you are a very weary, um, a, a very weary trader coming up the Bosphorus Straits from, um, let's say, the Levant. So I don't know, Beirut or Jaffa or something like that. And you're in your little boat with your books full of spices, and you you round the corner into the Bosphorus Straits, and then you see jutting out, literally on the water's edge, these enormous stone walls. So what's, let's start with those. What's the deal with the walls? So there have been a series of walls built around Constantinople, but the surviving ones have been installed in, I believe, the 5th century. Yeah by Emperor Theodosius. They're known as the Theodosian Walls. And these walls reason. will survive for a thousand years, and they will repel um, they will repel dozens, literally dozens of attackers. Yeah, exactly. Sorry, of a, sorry let me phrase that. Dozens, dozens of attackers. <laughs> dozens of attacking armies. Yes. Many people have laid siege to Constantinople, and very, very, very few attempts to do so have succeeded. And this is due, in large part, to these massive walls that surround it on all sides. And so these walls, to give you a sense of scale, um, they reach about 12 meters, so about 40 feet high, which <laughs> is not absolutely, doesn't come across <laughs> as absolutely massive now. But if you imagine being a attacking army and trying to make it over these walls while people are pouring down hot oil and arrows and spears and all sorts of things to repel you. Um, it's not easy. It's not fun. And as well, even though there are siege engines um, at the time, good luck trying to knock down or get through these walls because they're about four or five meters thick. <laughs> They're absolutely massive. This is the pinnacle, I would say, of Roman defensive technology at that time. Like, there's there's very, very, very few fortifications that are as formidable as Constant as the walls of Constantinople, and that's that is the reason why the Theodosian walls really sort of really outlast the the outlast the era that they're in. They really they really are the cutting edge when they're built. Yeah, and on this, um, and on land, the walls that surround Constantinople, it's not just these big walls, but it's a series of fortifications that start with a big moat, and then behind that, once you've gotten over that, there's a smaller wall, and then you have another massive wall to get over. Yeah, so if you jump out, if you manage to get over the first wall, you will get, you are basically in the firing line 
for everybody at the second taller wall. So you will get pin cushioned immediately. Yeah. So base, I mean, basically the thing about the Theodosian walls is because they're set up like that, all you need is enough people manning the battlements to make sure that anyone who, that the fire remains constant everywhere for anyone, like at every point of the walls so that anybody who comes over, dead in an instant. Absolutely, and there's ample opportunity for them to do this because there are also towers placed at regular intervals along the walls and there's crenellations that people can use to shoot arrows at you and anyone trying to fight back at an attacker from these walls is going to be very well guarded, very well defended. The other thing you need to understand about the about the Theodosian walls is that they don't just they aren't just powerful because they have um because they have this incredible military technology and they're so big. But they are imbued with spiritual power. These are sacrificed literally every single time there's a siege, and also regularly when there's not, by parading icons of the Virgin Mary, who is the protector of the city, um, around the walls to create a sort of spiritual force field. Now that sounds like hokum or something out of, like, Warhammer now, but I assure you it was absolutely real to the people who were living in it at the time. Yes. You, uh, like, you would, you would, when you were defending the city, you knew that you were not only protected by stone, but by metaphysical supernatural power. Absolutely. It's a city where if you lived there, you would have felt like you were chosen by God. You would have felt like God's favorite because it's just a, it's a special place to be. As you sail around this peninsula, around these great walls, and up into the Golden Horn, this natural harbor... Well, you would have seen thousands of ships. You would have seen thousands of ships, and you would have seen two towers at the edge, each edge of the entrance to the Golden Horn, to which either end of a massive chain is linked. Yes, the Great Chain of Istanbul. So this is a wonderful bit of sort of uh, sea defense that will come in handy for the Romans time and time again every time they're besieged. Basically, it's this enormous winched chain that can be tightened at any time. And basically, immediately if you do that, rises up out of the sea and it becomes this impassable barrier that you can't get around. Now, some people found ways around it. Harold Hadralda, ha uh, Harold Hadralda did once, um, but it is... It's this incredibly imposing piece of technology. Again, you you really do feel, I think, as somebody, and um, the medieval person entering the city for the first time, it really would feel like a kind of alien civilization in a way, because you've never seen anything on this scale before. Absolutely, and as you go into the city, as you moor your boat, and you walk through the gates into the great city, you're seeing even more things on every side of you that are just bowling you over. You're seeing this dense urban sprawl. I mean, this is a city with at least half a million people. Oh, yeah. You have the great palace of the emperor and the hippodrome. And as the you... largest sports stadium in the world for and will be for the next... <laughs> Absolutely. ...couple thousand years. Where there are just these sort of raucous, you know, riotous, packed chariot races and sporting events. And as you go further in, you come across the Hagia Sophia. I remember so vividly when I visited Istanbul, as my plane was sort of circling around the city, you get this incredible view of what the, the area of the city that was medieval Constantinople. And as soon as you see the Hagia Sophia, it's, you, it's like it's like being hit by lightning because it's like nothing in person. It's like nothing else in the world. I mean, photographs of it almost look like, I do not give it just, it looks kind of hunched over and kind of squat, but then you see it in person and it looks like, to paraphrase Bettany Mandel, who wrote a great book about the city, um, it looks like a sort of a surviving megafauna from some long-lost ice age. It really does feel like looking at a woolly mammoth in the flesh. It's almost uncanny. And then you, and then you go inside, 
and you see something impossible. You see the one of the biggest domes in the world that reaches up into the sky and it doesn't seem to be supported by anything. Like it's it doesn't seem to it it def, seems to defy the laws of gravity because there's no columns. It's almost a it's a self-supporting dome. It's crazy. And I mean the scene, I mean the, the the room itself is even today utterly awe-inspiring. There's this incredible golden gold lacquered roof on you uh, sort of there are four corners to this grand hall on each of them is this gigantic portrait of a seraphim one of the an angel with a sort of human face and then four wings that sort of glowers at you and each one of those things is like two stories tall and they occupy like these tiny spots in the corner it's a it's an it's an interior that's almost impossible to photograph because it is um just vast the way that I feel when I see it is it feels like a scale model of the universe. And that was very deliberate because the Hagia Sophia was designed uh, on the orders of the Emperor Justinian. You met him in episode three. He, Justinian of the, of the hot, powerful wife. Um, to be a manifestation of heaven on earth. There is a possibly apocryphal story of a group of Russian uh, ambassadors sent by Tsar Vladimir the First, who went to Hagia Sophia and said that we no longer knew whether we were in heaven or on earth, and we know not how to tell of it. Wow, it's pretty good. <laughs> it's pretty good stuff. <laughs> so you you go past these monumental buildings that are again on a scale and a grandeur that nothing you would have experienced in your life. And to this day, I'd say in many cases, are like nothing you've experienced in your life. Well, for, for a thousand years, the Hagia Sophia was the largest cathedral in the world. It was the largest building in the world for a lot of that. Yeah. Um, and you find yourself in the other heart of the city. Not the spiritual heart or the political heart, but the commercial heart. The great markets. Because Constantinople as a city is the commercial heart at this point of the Roman Empire. All of the commerce flows into the city, and it also serves because it's the seat of government as the distribution point of wealth, and everything is sent back out again. And so you have this really sort of well-regulated, tightly structured system of commerce about who is allowed to sell what, under what circumstances, how exactly every sort of single aspect of commerce should be carried out. And we have evidence of a lot of this in the form of a book, a 9th century book called The Book of the Prefect, that basically gives guidance for how the prefect, um, also known as the eparch, um, should regulate the trade in Constantinople, because that is the role of the eparch, and um, I was reading through an English translation of this book, actually, and it really is just a list of the most kind of niche and obscure <laughs> laws, um, some of which I will read out to you today. So here are some things to bear in mind if you want to be a merchant in 9th century Constantinople. Notaries should be of good character and not be saucy. <laughs> <laughs> Ooh la la. Silk merchants may not sell purple fabric to strangers. Well, it's the imperial color, of course. Perfumers may not sell their herbs as groceries for side income. <laughs> However, they may switch to being full-time grocers if they like. Grocers may not sell their herbs for perfume purposes. However, they may switch to being full-time perfumers if they like. Pork butchers may not enter into operation until they can provide character references. So you need a guy to say, <laughs> yeah, I think he'd make an all right pork. This is only pork yeah, butchers. Yeah, that's pig. Which, by the way, you can only be a pork butcher if you don't butcher other animals as well. There's pork guys and there's guys for all the other kinds of meat. I don't know why. Um, bakers are exempt from all public service obligations. So <laughs> if the whole country is going to war, 
bakers stay at home well, because bake no, the bread? Because the distribution of bread is an incredibly important part of, of, of city life because bread was distributed for free. Exactly. It was a form of... Like, it was a form of welfare. Yeah, it's a form of UBI, universal bread income. <laughs> <laughs> and the last uh, rule that I have, bakers may not build their ovens under wooden houses. <laughs> Fair enough. Very sensible. Fair enough. Very sensible. I have to be honest, that does read a little bit like a sort of EU directive. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, yeah, this was the e the sort of EU style center of control for commerce because you have all these laws saying, you know, how long you have to study for in order to become a merchant or a craftsman for certain things and sort of the quality standards that should be met. And usually the punishments for breaking things, breaking these laws are like flogging or imprisonment or heavy fines. So broke the rules, simple as. Exactly. So yeah, as you're walking through this market district, you're seeing artisans and merchants and salespeople of all kinds, and they all have dedicated locations as well for where they're allowed to conduct their trade. And it's all very well regulated. And in sort of the inner part of this, you have things like goldsmiths and jewelers and spice merchants and people who deal in what could be called slightly more luxurious commodities. And then around those on the outside, you have people like butchers and blacksmiths and tanners and things that smell. If you if it exists, you can buy it in Constantinople. And by the way, I mentioned that the vernacular language of, uh, of Constantinople was Greek, but it wouldn't have just been Greek that you heard on the streets of the market districts. You would have heard languages from all over Eurasia. Um, you know, there were a lot of, there were, I mean, there were so many Muslim traders that the city had to set up, like, dedicated mosques for them, um, which is wild, <laughs> given what will happen later. <laughs> um, well, no, I mean, not, actually, no, it's not that wild, because it, it's consistent with this trend of accommodation of diversity. But there's also traders from, you know, our, we have Armenians, we have Italians, we have anybody who's anybody is showing up here, even China. Now, European contact with China was sporadic, shall say the least, because it's very far away and it's very hard to get across Central Asia without a train or a plane. Um, but there was trade with, um, with China. And we know there was trade for a couple of reasons. One, because we have excellent uh, records from Chinese court sources of these uh, Roman uh, these emissaries from the, this mysterious land of the Romans who show up uh, every couple of centuries and sort of say, hey, we're here, have some stuff. Um, interestingly, um, the Chinese name for the Roman Empire is Fulin, which is a signification of Polin or Polis, which means that they were introducing themselves as representatives of the city, <laughs> which goes to show how central, again, how central the, um, the city was to the Roman sense of self. And Chinese sources, like there's a book called The Book of Tang, have actually quite accurate descriptions of what life is like in Constantinople. Um, but I, what my favorite part about it is the uh, uncanny similarities in the things the Chinese get wrong about the Europeans and the things that the Europeans get wrong about the Chinese. We mentioned in a previous episode how there are all these ideas floating around Europe that Asia is full of men with dog heads and people who have faces on their chests and all that kind of stuff. What I didn't realize until cracking open a few books for this episode <laughs> is that Chinese people thought the exact same things about us. <laughs> so, for example, the ancient Romans thought the Chinese harvested their silk by combing it from the leaves of a tree. The Chinese thought that the Romans produced cotton by combing the hair of a special kind of water sheep. <laughs> yes! There's an ancient Chinese book called The Classic of Mountains and Seas, which contains stories and illustrations of weird people from the lands of the West, including guys who have their faces on their chests. That's unbelievably cool. There's something... I had no idea. There's something... I knew you'd like that. That's there's something really universal about this, I think. What if man face was chest? <laughs> <laughs> Does this... Now, this is where I go all ancient aliens, and I'm like, this tells us that they were real. This tells us that, you know, the, there was a secret cabal of man, chest face man, carrying, pulling the strings. 
Yeah. Definitely. <laughs> It wasn't just people from the East who were coming to Constantinople. There were also people coming from the North. Because the thing about Constantinople is because it's such a huge city, it has this almost centrifugal effect. Where the richer it gets, the more the legends are spreading about the, the wealth of this great city in the South. And the more that draws in people from further and further afield. And one of the peoples that gets drawn by these promises of, like, infinite gold... Uh, are the Vikings. Now you might be saying, how on earth do the Vikings get from uh, from Scandinavia to Thrace? Because there's a whole all of Eastern Europe in the way? Rivers. Viking boats are light, so they're easy to portage, and they're flat, so they are good on rivers. So you so the Viking Viking traders go on these epic journeys down the riverways of Eastern Europe, accidentally founding societies along the way, and come to Constantinople to seek their seek their fortune. I mentioned Harald Hadralda, who English listeners will know as one of the legendary claimants to the English throne in 1066. He was one of these Vikings who made the journey down to Constantinople. The Vikings stand out from, I think, every other kind of outsider in that they were afforded a special place in, um, in Roman society. Because even though they were definitively not Christian... <laughs> no, sir. At this, not yet, anyway. They, um, at least not to start with, they, as long as they could sort of pretend to be, they would be given a very, very, very special job, which was being the emperor's bodyguard. They were referred to as the Varangians, which is basically the Greek name for Viking. Um, and they formed the Varangian guards. Which, you know, makes sense. These absolutely massive, hulking... <laughs> maniacs show up who are wielding axes which you've never seen that before in your life yeah a guy with a battle axe these swaggering exotic northern men with their long beards and their sort of weird customs and they would have just you know the way that they dressed and the way that they presented themselves would have been so foreign it's it a culture shock amazing but they all but because they're so foreign they can be trusted because they are outside of the intersinite like factionalism and political anarchy that characterized the Roman Empire. So they could be trusted to not kill you in your sleep because they didn't care. They were just happy to get paid by the emperor. As long as they got their wages paid, they were fine. So they became not only the emperor's bodyguards, but shock troops. And they show up in the sort of backgrounds of so many great episodes in the city's history. There's just like, oh, and then there were Varangians there. And they were kind of legendary for being a bit chaotic they were referred to by disgruntled romans as the emperor's wine bags <laughs> because of how hard they drank they were they would graffiti on the um they would graffiti on the walls of the hagia sophia things like half dan was here yeah this is one thing that i love about vikings is that they were mostly a pre-literate society and that they didn't have like a strong culture of writing but they did have runes and runes were basically just used to, like, carve messages into rocks, which, in principle, they used to make, like, monuments and, you know, dedications. But in practice, you also just get all over Europe <laughs> these rocks turning up that say things like, you know, Eric touched a boob here. <laughs> there was one, I think, in Scotland that was in, like, a crypt or a tomb or something that was written, like, 12 feet up the wall. And it was a runic inscription that said, this writing is very high up. <laughs> Which I love. Um, yeah, they were, they were chaotic. And, and we, we love them for that. There was a great story that I was reading about. It's also in um, this Bettany Hughes book, Istanbul, about a Varangian who tried to essentially force himself on a Byzantine woman. And by some sort of twist of fate, she managed to grab his sword and stab him and kill him. And when his Varangian mates learned about this, they allegedly all applauded her, gave her a crown, 
dumped their friend's body <laughs> without a burial <laughs> and then gave him all gave her all of his clothes which clothes in the middle ages would have basically been the most valuable thing you owned so yeah. they basically said well well done well done fair play <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> Huzzah! and then probably bought a round <laughs> I mean, I love the, I love that they're incredibly mercenary. I mean, they, yeah, they're basically these swaggering, mercenary, hard drinking, hard partying lads, yeah. essentially. And I also love that, like, legends make their way back to Scandinavia about how much money there is to be made as a Varangian. The Scandinavian legends say that, oh, well, you know, when the emperor dies, then his, his bodyguards get to loot the palace. <laughs> this was definitely not true. <laughs> But it's it's emblematic of the kind of tall tales. It's like the old immigrant thing about, like, in America, about, oh, the streets are paved with gold. Well, it has the energy of, you know, if someone dies during the test, everyone passes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. There's another kind of legend that makes its way back to Scandinavia from Constantinople via the Vikings, which is a little bit hard to substantiate, but I think makes intuitive sense. There are a lot of historians who would suggest that the urban landscape of Constantinople in its glittering, golden, like, grand... grandeur... <laughs> um, is the inspiration for Valhalla specifically. And, you know, I think that's maybe taking it a bit far, but I think there's definitely something to be said for the idea that when people are picture, when Vikings are picturing Valhalla, which is a very real place to them, they are imagining something to the effect of Constantinople. Now, the reason I think that's compelling is because something very interesting happens when the Vikings convert to Christianity. But I think that I think you can see the the cultural importance of Constantinople in the sort of dream architecture of Norse mythology when the Vikings convert to Christianity, because the first kind of written records that we get about the Aesir and the, and the sort of the pantheon of the of the Norse gods comes from Christian Norse writers like the possibly apocryphal Snorri who wrote the Prose Edda. Now in the Prose Edda, um, Snorri tries to rationalize the, the, the legends of Yore with the new Christian faith. And he says, ah, okay, there's a misunderstanding here. We've been thinking that the Aesir are, like, deities. No, 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 they are actually the great Christian kings who came from Troy, which was the first Asgard, and refounded Asgard in, in Scandinavia. Less famously, another Norse uh, historian called Saxo Grammaticus says, oh, no, 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 no. Asgard was a real place, but it was it was never in Troy. It was in Constantinople. Wow. And by the way, the I should say very quickly, the idea that oh actually we were Tro we are Trojan exiles is an idea that basically every non Roman <laughs> culture has. <laughs> like even even down to the, the Turks, because it's a way of inserting yourself into the classical narrative. Anyway, just a I thought that was a fun aside, but I think it I think it speaks to the fact that Constantinople is an enduring, has an enduring place in mythology and is a huge reference point for Christians all over the world. The image that comes to mind is, for me, is Constantinople as the center of gravity in mm -hmm. the Christian world. That things and people and ideas were pulled towards Constantinople because it's also a scholarly hub as well, and yeah. it's also sort of a cultural hub in the arts and the sciences and everything, especially early on, sort of 10th century and earlier, everything is that's happening is sort of happening in Constantinople. And, um, and so, yeah, you just get this massive body of literature and thinking and ideas, even from the most far-flung places that treat Constantinople as this center of their world. Um, one that I really liked is a French poem. This is actually a later one. This is a 12th century medieval French poem called Le 
Pelerinage de Charle Charlemagne. I don't know how they pronounce his name in French. It's the Pilgrimage of Charlemagne. Um, and it's this great story. I couldn't actually find that much about it. I don't think this has survived alongside, like, the Canterbury Tales and Beowulf as one of, like, the modern world's favorite medieval stories. But it's a story about Charlemagne having dinner with his wife and him saying, wife, is, it, is there anyone who's a better king than me? And his wife says, yes, Charlemagne, the Byzantine emperor, who is named Hugo, <laughs> is a better king than you. <laughs> and it absolutely ruins Charlemagne's life. So he goes all the way to Constantinople and sees this massive, gorgeous hunk standing <laughs> on, a, Chad. on a golden plow. <laughs> flexing. Flexing, surrounded by beautiful women. And he's immediately like, uh-oh. And he wants to prove himself. And so he and his men start making all of these claims. One of them claims that he is able to sleep with a woman a hundred times in a single night. And they make all these claims about these feats of strength that they absolutely cannot follow through on. And then they go, they go to bed and, like, pray. And pray to the Virgin Mary, and she grants them the power to do all of these things. Yes! So that Charlemagne can assert himself as, um, as the, the most powerful king in the world. Which, I don't know. I, again, I tried to find, like, is this a satire? Is this, what's the point here? Um, I think it might be lost to time. I mean, to be honest, you know what it reminds me of? I might have just had Aesir on the brain from mm -hmm. talking about Vikings for so long. But it does feel a little bit like, you know when Thor goes to that castle? And he's oh, like, yeah. Yeah. this is this drinking horn has taken me a long time to drink. Yeah. <laughs> like exactly. it, it has the, it has the, it speaks to, I think, the mythical quality that the city kind of has. I have another story of a, of a Latin Christian going to Constantinople um, and being sort of awed by it. So there's a great story about a Venetian uh, ambassador, Luitprand of Cremona, uh, who represents uh, King Berengar of Italy. So he visits Constantinople in 949, and he's given an audience with the emperor. And he's brought to the great reception hall where two eunuchs lift him up on their on their shoulders and carry him into the throne room and as he enters the throne room he sees an amazing gilded bronze tree and every branch of this tree is filled with singing mechanical birds each one of these birds sings the accurate bird song of its species um and he's brought closer towards the go the great golden throne of, uh, of Constantinople, and he sees two gilded lions with mechanical tails that, whose mouths open and close, and they roar at him. Um, he looks up at the throne, and there's the emperor, Constantine the Seventh, uh, who's glittering with jewels, and he's wearing his golden imperial robes, um, and he sort of does what you do when you, when you meet the emperor, which is you prostrate yourself, you get down Suck on the on ground. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then he raises his head, and he sees that Constantine's throne has shut up nine meters from the floor. And he's, now, <laughs> he's now sitting on a giant column wow. looking down at him, um, and is somehow, is somehow wearing a different robe. <laughs> wow. Anyway, they have this a bit of... Like what, this is like what like Rihanna does when she goes on tour. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, they have a bit of an awkward chit chat, and he gets invited for dinner. And at dinner, all the plates come down from the ceiling on yes. these giant mechanical. Now, of course, you know they had automatons in the Middle Ages, but do I think that's real? No, I don't. It would have been a faff. It would have been unbelievably funny to like mog this <laughs> Italian yeah. with your big mechanical throne. Yeah. Um, but. I think what that speaks to is the sort of, it's, the descriptions of this place are fated in this kind of mythological, fantastical vibe. It feels like, the only thing I can think of and compare it to is actually Baghdad in more or less the same period. It feels like, as much as, like, Baghdad is like this sort of mystical place in the kind of Islamic mind where strange things happen and like eccentric characters are around every corner and i think that and you know that's obviously explored in like thousand and one arabian nights but i feel like if i was looking for an analog 
to for Constantinople, I'd say that, and its cultural place in the Christian mind, I would say that it's that. To sort of touch briefly as well on Western visual depictions of Constantinople, I've looked at quite a few um, maps and depictions of Constantinople. Well, there's some in your wonderful book. It, yes, there are some, in fact, in my wonderful book. Um, and there are many in medieval manuscripts from Western Europe. And one thing that really stands out as well is how medieval manuscripts in general tend to depict cities quite uniformly, no matter what the city is. And you see this, for instance, like in the Nuremberg Chronicles, where they use actually the same print for like <laughs> 20 different cities. Um, but in depictions of Constantinople, it's always extremely distinctive. You always see the Hagia Sophia. The walls. You always see the walls. You always see the geography of the area. You will quite often see the Great Chain. Yes. And this is not a treatment that's given to many cities, even important cities that are closer to home. So it's iconic, also mm. in the literal sense. It's a bit like, to use a modern analogy, it's a bit like watching, you know, um, I don't know, Gossip Girl or The Avengers or whatever. You, If after a while you feel like you know New York City. Yeah. And when you go there, it's this kind of bewildering experience because you're like, I've seen that a billion times and now it's three-dimensional. What is going on? So we, we've told you everything that there is to know about the kingdom of heaven on earth, uh, which is Constantinople. But now, like every good king, heavenly kingdom, we need to talk about how it falls. So obviously, you know, the fall of Constantinople happens in 1453. That is well documented. <laughs> but what are the long-term historical forces that lead that lead us to that point? So we've talked a lot about Constantinople as this center of Christendom and this incredibly important, you know, the city that's incredibly important to Christianity. But it's important to bring up the fact that pretty early on in Constantinople's development, there's been a schism in the Christian world. And so for most of what we think of as the Middle Ages, the Romans are not, funnily enough, Roman Catholic, <laughs> like most of Europe, but rather are part of the Orthodox Church. So a separate church. Yes, well, not only that, but they are the heads of the Orthodox yes. Church, really, because the uh... The, the Patriarch of Constantinople is kind of, ends up being sort of analogous, God, that's going to piss some people off, <laughs> but sort of analogous to the, the, the papacy. I, I agree, and I think to go into why this schism took place and all of the events that led up to and followed it would, of course, be probably a entire podcast of its own. That's... Not a podcast episode, an entire podcast. Exactly, yes, yes. But what's important to stress here is that although Constantinople is a Christian city, what we see over the course of the Middle Ages is a gradual alienation of these two churches from each other, and that they don't perceive each other as sort of, you know, distinct groups that nevertheless, you know, are part of the same sort of cultural sphere and same system of beliefs, but there's an increasing polarization. Yeah, I mean, you can see that just in the way that the, the Roman emperors start to be referred to under, in, in, the, in the medieval period, so it starts to be referred to in the in the sort of western sources as the emperor of the greeks rather than sort of recognizing the recognizing the the continuity of the roman empire because of course the the western latin christians think of themselves as just as you know just as much the inheritors um of the roman tradition as the that bastard in constantinople exactly and of course it's not strictly just religious differences that lead to this, um, you know, widening of the gulf between these two churches. Um, of course, there's a pretty significant sort of political element as well. And you have a series of 
events um, that take place that kind of increase the tensions between these um, these two worlds. I would say a pretty big one is the <laughs> the Pope recognizing the Holy Roman Empire. So in the in the uh, ninth century, the the papacy sort of formally recognizes the successors to the Carolingian Empire as the Holy Roman Emperors, not the Roman Emperors in the West, but the Roman Empire, which is, you know, quite bizarre to the to the Romans in Constantinople because they're like, these are just a bunch of Germans. Yeah. <laughs> There's nothing Roman about them. But, you know, the, if the Pope says so, it must be true. Um, so you have these great exchanges where they sort of, the two emperors will sort of write to each other. Be like, ah, the emperor of the Germans. Ah, the emperor of the Greeks. Hello. <laughs> and there are attempts to mend that. There is a there is an attempt to, it, the, all this starts because the Rome, because the, because um, Constantinople gets briefly a female emperor, not an empress, because an empress is subordinate to an emperor, but a female emperor called Irene. And this is obviously heresy. And that's the pretext for the Pope to sort of go, oh no, this is actually the real Roman Empire. Don't even worry yeah. about it. And there are attempts to um, to mend that over the years. There are attempts to marry off Irene um, to the Holy Roman Emperor, which, God, what would have happened if that had gone through? Who even who even knows what the world would be There's like? Probably some fan fiction out there. <laughs> Pull up AO3, do some real history research. I'm, I might do, actually. Oh, God. In, the, in your own time, yeah. thank you. Okay, fair enough. Um, once I've left. <laughs> um, but it never, gets, it never gets resolved. And especially, I think, because there's a continued expectation by the Pope that he will be the head of the Christian world. And the fact that the Orthodox, the Greek church, won't submit to him um, that continues to be sort of a, a thorn in the side of the papacy. Yeah, because the the problem is that the in the in the in the Roman uh, the Byzantine Roman system, you know the 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 uh, the patriarch of Constantinople is powerful, but he is ultimately appointed by the emperor. Whereas the the pope is kind of over the course of the Middle Ages becomes increasingly the papacy becomes its own power structure and its own power center that can't be reconciled, I don't think, to the, with, with, with the Roman imperial system, which is still very much, still, I mean, the Romans, we haven't talked much about the Roman state, but it very much is still the same state structure that you have inherited from the days of the first Caesars. Like, you have the emperor and the senate and the armies, and, like, it's, it's the same. <laughs> yeah. And that is not the system that is developing to the West where you have this really kind of distributed power structure, where you have all these independent sort of actors and kingdoms and and, diff and sort of nebulous, wobbly, inconsistent sovereignties. Like, the, they are, these worlds are diverging and getting, like, less and less recognizably... It's like, you know, they become less and less recognizably of the same source even though they start as self-consciously inherit, both start as self-conscious inheritors of the same state and the same heritage. Exactly. And this translates as well, it's worth saying, to tensions on the ground, so to speak, between everyday people in both of these empires, but in particular Constantinople, which, unlike a lot of cities further west, has a sizable minority population of the other flavor, so to speak, of Christianity. Yeah. And this lays the groundwork for tensions between these two communities to rise. And I think it's, it's hard to sort of pin down when exactly these sort of two churches became so alienated from each other that they began to become more antagonistic towards each other but especially over the course of the 12th century, you have events such as the massacre of the Latins in Constantinople, mm. which basically takes place not with the endorsement of the Roman emperor, but not with his condemnation either, in which the Greek Orthodox population essentially just murder all of the Roman Catholics. An episode that I should say I think will have, will have echoes all the way down 
the following, you know, 800 years. It speaks to, I think, the sense that, like, when a state is threatened or uncomfortable or feels boxed in, it will lash out against its its minorities. And this is something that you absolutely see in, um, in, Con in Constantinople as the sort of relationship with the West deteriorates. And it has wider implications for the success of the Roman state because despite these, this hostility that's forming, Constantinople and the Roman state in general are still reliant upon external trade, including trade from Catholic Europe as part of their economy. And because they're situated at this sort of crossroads between East and West, they can't go around making too many enemies or else they're going to find that they're caught between essentially a rock and a hard place. So we've talked about the rock, let's talk about the hard place. Because it's not just from the West that they're having problems, but also from the East. Um, so we've talked before about how the, the, the Eastern half of the Roman Empire that survives is the, the fall of Rome is the bit that has the Levant, the Holy Land, North Africa, all places that are now, um, with, a, with a few exceptions, majority Muslim. And that is not an accident, because in the 7th century, a guy called Muhammad is born from a relatively nondescript but fairly wealthy Arab family. Um, I'm going to condense this significantly so that I don't um, so that I don't mess anything up but ba essentially long story short he found he has a revelation founds a new religion Islam um, and takes off you know at great speed to conquer the Middle East and his successors um, found uh, the Umayyad Caliphate which is the first Muslim state now this is a disaster for the Romans because this is on their doorstep and they have to and the in the sort of 7th and 8th centuries they have to face down these new uh, Arab Muslims and it does not go well <laughs> they take Jerusalem they take the Levant they take pretty much all of the all of the territory I'd say um, east of like Anatolia is gone is under under Muslim control and again, as I've mentioned before, places like Syria are some of the richest provinces of um, of the Roman Empire. And then they lose Egypt, which is the breadbasket of the empire. That they are getting more and more boxed in. The like the the sort of the fertile valleys that have been feeding the feeding the vast Roman armies are no longer available to them. And this is and by the way, the Arabs get all the way to Constantinople a couple of times. And manage to besiege it. it. Never, they never succeed, um, which has a huge, I'd say, cultural impact on the Arabs, who've only really known success for a yeah. couple of generations. So there are of the hadiths, so the sayings of the prophet. There are twenty-eight about the Romans, including how noble they are, how Muslims and Romans will one day form an alliance against a common enemy, and how most importantly about how bloody hard they are to beat in battle. Uh, there are 12 that are explicitly about Constantinople. But all the same, there is, there is a saying, there is a hadith attributed to Muhammad that says, Constantinople will be conquered. Blessed is the commander who will conquer it, and blessed are his troops. I wonder, if, I wonder if that's setting anything up. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder if this episode was... Has, has been laying some foundations for some things. No spoilers, unfortunately. Definitely not. Yeah. The Romans, in the end, do manage to hold off the, the Islamic armies, and they sort of form an uneasy peace. Um, so, you know, the, they, they sort of settle into these borders of, of, that are much, much, much reduced, but more or less they manage, they still control, like, the southern Balkans and eastern Anatolia. That's basically all that's left for the Roman Empire by, by the 9th century. But, you know, in Constantinople, the money's still good. Um, they've survived the cataclysm. But it's a very culturally traumatic experience for them. Because they have now... Lo it's, it's the biggest reversal, I would say, of Roman fortune since the fall of Rome. So there's this text 
that springs up around the time that the that the Romans are just recovering from the siege of Constantinople, um, called the Apocalypse of Pseudo Methodius. That's not what it was called at the time. At the time, it was just called the Apocalypse because it was attributed to a guy called Methodius, who was a fourth century Christian scholar. Um, it's in a Syriac, and it was sort of it was probably written in Constantinople. But not by Methodius. But not by Methodius. He was a real guy, but did not write this. Yes. This was a forgery. Not that it stopped it from being an incredibly influential text. The Apocalypse of Pseudo-Methodius claims that uh, when, when the city of Constantinople is besieged and the armies of Islam are bearing down upon it, a forlorn prayer to God will awaken the last Roman emperor, who will drive the Muslims out of the city, and then out of the Holy Land itself, and bring about the end of the world. Which means that there may be some Christian interest in allowing Constantinople then to fall. But they'd never do that. Well... <laughs> <laughs> This takes us to what I would argue is the beginning of the end for Roman Constantinople. It's the this is the low point. A little something that was that is known today as the Fourth Crusade, but at the time was probably just known as fuck. Oh shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh no. <laughs> oh god. Oh no. Oh god. Oh Jesus. So let's change our scope a little bit briefly and head west to the Catholic world. So it's hard to know where to start with the Fourth Crusade um, and the, the factors that lead up to it, but I just want to emphasize again this sort of schism that grew between the Orthodox and the Catholic churches. And again, this is quite complicated, but I shouldn't necessarily need to explain anyways why um, in 1202 the Pope would call for a crusade. So they which popes want... had been doing for a while. Which this was not in and of a... itself um, the, the sort of clanging chimes of doom for the Roman Empire. No, this has nothing to do with the Roman Empire. In fact, on paper, um, this, is a, this is a crusade that's called by the new pope to retake the Holy Land and... On the way, they also want to retake Egypt so that they can have the lands around the Holy Land in order to supply their soldiers and hopefully create a slightly longer-lived crusader state, since crusader states had not historically been extremely successful in fostering long-term <laughs> stability. Oh, because they're all insane. Yes, and essentially, this is... I think the Fourth Crusade, I think almost everyone that hears about it and knows about it will agree that it's kind of one of the most tragic episodes in European history. And I think one of the factors that makes it so tragic is that there was just kind of like, utter, it was so preventable and there was just stupidity and greed and bad decision making. It's, it's pointless. At it's every so turn. pointless. And it was, and, and it all started with essentially a clerical error. <laughs> so the crusade leaders had enlisted the Venetians who generally weren't in the business of crusading because they only sort of deal in like shipbuilding and commerce. They don't have farms. If and they, they want to sell every, they want to sell everything to everyone. Exactly. Including exactly. Including Muslims. And yes. as we've talked about before, Venetians were in the, the Venetians are in the spice trade, which actually involves Egypt pretty heavily. It involves Egypt pretty heavily. The Venetians are also heavily involved with the Romans and with Constantinople. And because of these tensions that are growing between the Catholics, um, who had just been, you know, murdered en masse about two decades ago in Constantinople, the Venetians all of a sudden do have reason to be a little bit more, perhaps, adventurous and to 
push the boat out a little bit more, so to speak. Good pun. Thank you. Um, and so when the Pope says, hey, do you guys want to crusade? The Venetians are like, sure, how many guys? And the Pope and the crusader leaders say, oh, about 30,000. And also we want to send them over by boat, which had never been done before because you need a massive, massive number of boats to send all of those people. And this is a massive army, by the way, by 13th century standards or by pre-modern standards in the first place. But the Venetians, you know, ever obliging and always happy to make some money, say, sure thing, no problem, that will be 85,000 silver marks, um, and we'll get the boats to you in a year. So, so essentially, um, through a series of misunderstandings, only one third of the expected crusaders show up in Venice to get on these boats, and essentially their plan to pay for these boats at this point had just been to like pass around collections and everyone chips in a little bit. At which point they find themselves unable to pay even half of what the Venetians wanted. The Venetians, who had, again, basically dropped everything for a year to fulfill this contract, and also had put, like, literally a tenth of their population on these boats to crew them, were like, hey man, that's not cool. <laughs> But no one knows what to do, because what do you do in a situation like that? At which point, enter the Doge of Venice. Who is a fantastic char character. He is this blind 80-year-old, like, he really does, he really, when you read about him, he really does feel like a sort of Bond villain. He should be sort of stroking a white cat. Like, he's this, he's, he's this very sinister guy. By the way, at the exact same time that he's making a plan to um that he was making a plan to uh support a crusade into egypt this man is also signing a trade deal with egypt on the down low <laughs> yeah exactly he's completely machiavellian he's he's playing he is literally like mac and it's always sunny playing both sides so he always ends up on top <laughs> yeah exactly and so the doge um whose name is enrico by the way enrico says well something's got to give and of course you guys probably want to you know get to your crusade we can't give you these ships unless you pay us so i have an idea let's all get into these ships together and basically go up the adriatic coast and along the coast of the mediterranean eastwards and basically shake down all these cities <laughs> for money <laughs> And they do exactly that, and they end up at the city in modern-day Croatia um, of Zara, which is a Catholic city, and the Catholics in Zara see them coming, and they start unrolling all of these sort of Catholic banners and cross banners, you know, saying, surely crusaders won't, you know, <laughs> ravage a town of fellow Catholics, to oh. which the Venetians say, guess again, <laughs> and they do it. And what a bet. <laughs> exactly. And the whole time, the Pope, who's like 36, is like one of the youngest popes ever and has just assumed the papacy, is sending them letters like, guys, please stop. Don't do this. I'm going to excommunicate you. No, seriously, this time. Which the Venetian elites are basically reading and throwing away and not telling any of the crusaders about. And to make matters worse, um, around this time, there is and has been an exodus from Constantinople of sort of would-be emperors and would-be usurpers from the emperor's family. Yeah, because, I mean, the not to get too into Roman succession practices, but emperors were usually quite short-lived in medieval Constantinople. There was a lot of coups. There was a lot of political instability, in part because there was a very, very informal... Um, system for choosing a new emperor. They didn't have hereditary succession or anything like that. It was just a guy... Basically, whoever could get the army on their side would become the emperor for, you know, as long as that was the case. Yeah, exactly. As a brilliant aside from the Chinese source where they sort of speculate that maybe the Romans, they pick their emperors based on merit and have, ter <laughs> and have term limits because they seem to go through them really quick. Yep. Yeah, and so you have all of these kind of minor nobles fleeing Constantinople, and they often wash up in the courts of random European monarchs and nobles, and they 
tend to say things like, guys, I'm the true leader of the Romans, give me some money and some troops and, um, you know, help restore me and I'll do you favors. And usually these pleas are falling upon deaf ears, except for one, a guy named Alexei, who manages to basically fall in with one of the crusader leaders and says, hey guys, listen, if you bring me to Constantinople, and restore me to the throne, which, by the way, will be super easy because I'm the true leader. Everyone there knows it um, because I'm the next in the line of succession. I'm the oldest son of the previous monarch or whatever. Who had been, because there, had, there was a succession crisis around this time because the previous emperor had been, had been deposed in a coup. And so there was, there was a pretext for restoring an emperor. Yes. But it certainly wasn't Alexei. No, and also coups were seen as somewhat legitimate by the Romans, you yeah. know. If you fail, you get binned. Exactly. But not knowing this, um, the Catholics hear him out, and he says, if you do this for me, I will give you loads of money. He promises them something like twice what they owe the Venetians, <laughs> two or three times that much, and says also, I'll pay off the Venetians separately, and I'll give you my navy and lots of knights to transport you to the Holy Land and to help you retake the Holy Land. And also, I will bring the entire Orthodox Church under the control of the papacy. We will basically become a different branch of Catholics. Complete, complete, complete horseshit. And the this man is a huge grifter. Well, you know what they say about Greeks bearing gifts. <laughs> 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 and... And I think a, a something that's worth uh, mentioning at this point is that Enrico the Doge of Venice, who is with the Crusaders, has tagged along and is sort of just, you know, one can only assume standing on the decks of the ships, you know, stroking his cat or chuckling yes, malevolently and yes. saying yes. <laughs> All is proceeding according to plan. <laughs> now witness the full power of this fully operational Crusader army. Exactly. No, That was terrible. He's probably going like, you know, Mamma mia, <laughs> you don't have our money. We're gonna have to do something about that. <laughs> anyway, so... Anyway, this guy... Has Enrico has been previously an ambassador to the Romans in Constantinople. He definitely knows that that's not going to happen. Yeah. One can only assume the other Venetians and leaders probably don't uh, think that it's going to happen either. And so it's hard to say exactly why they're kind of just like, yeah, sure, man. Because they've got nowhere else to go. They've got nowhere else to go. They still need more money. And importantly... They're, they know that, you know, the Pope won't necessarily be as upset if the people that they're fighting, although they're not supposed to fight fellow Christians, well, these are Greek Orthodox Christians. They're like a lesser kind of Christian. Exactly. In the, in the, in the Latin sort of imagination. Exactly. So they sail for Constantinople, and they there's this really hilarious story of them essentially... Like lifting Alexa yes. up <laughs> and sailing their ships along the walls of Constantinople, saying, "Look, it's the emperor! We've brought your true emperor back!" And, and everybody's the, like, "Who the fuck is the this? Romans?" There's stories of the Romans laughing at them. They throw cabbage. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And to cut a long story short, they basically end up in Constantinople for about a year trying to sort things out, going through different emperors as they're like coups and emperors are fleeing. And it all There's culminates. like three emperor. There's like multiple emperor Alexis in yeah. the space of a year. Because they actually do get their guy in, at which point he looks at the treasuries and he's like, oops. Sorry. <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, I was kidding. Yeah. At which point everything comes to a head in 1204 and the Crusaders break into Constantinople. Well, there's a brilliant, there's a brilliant sort of moment. The, the, the moment that sort of precedes this is... After Alexei's been deposed, there's a, there's another emperor, I think Manuel, um, who sort of who is the biggest wimp of all of them because he he says, you know what? Okay, screw this. I'm gonna. I have the bigger army. Why am I wasting time with these absolute grifters? I'm gonna just crush them like a bug. So the great. So the the Crusader armies are outside of Constantinople, and the great gates grind open. 
And then this huge Roman army in like full panoply of war comes out. He's got he's got infantry divisions. He has the cataphracts, the legendary armored horsemen of the of the Roman Empire, and they are outnumbered enormously. The the they, the Roman Empire is, the Roman army is so much bigger. And the and the the, uh, the the Crusaders they prepare to make their final stand. They're like, let's go. And then Emperor Manuel panics, <laughs> and he's like, "Actually, we're going back in." Yeah, yeah. It's it's again. And it all unravels from there. I can only describe the the crusade as like bungled. It was just bungled at every turn. <laughs> um, and yeah, the crusaders perceive like this is what's owed to us, and the clergy who are with them and the Venetians are urging them on. You know, trying to keep them in Constantinople and urging them to attack Constantinople, saying things like, this is what God wants, this is what, yeah. you know, has been foretold. And so they break into Constantinople, eventually, this horde of crusaders, and what takes place there could certainly be described as apocalyptic. Rape, pillage, um, I mean, it's, it's, it's horrifying. They slaughter thousands of people. Um, thousands of civilians. They they rape thousands upon thousands of women. They take. They burn down great palaces. They they just destroy it. They desecrate churches. Yeah. So not only did they desecrate churches, but they they broke into the Hagia Sophia itself, mm -hmm. and uh, they started obviously stripping the altar of all of its precious stones and gold. And the men uh, get drunk on the communion wine and cheer as a camp prostitute stands on the seat of the patriarch and starts dancing and singing sexy French songs. <laughs> they basically just ravage through Constantinople. They take everything that's not nailed down. And Constantinople at this point is still home to this massive wealth of art, of religious art, but also of ancient art that had been brought their art going all the way back to the ancient Greek period. And there's all these records we have of bronze statues that had been, you know, in place and had been created a thousand years ago or more, 1,500-year-old statues that were just essentially ripped down and melted down for their raw materials. And that was, that was essentially what became of Constantinople. Everything was only worth its raw materials. All yeah. the gold was melted down, all of the metals, and the Venetians, um, who were also sort of quite keen to get what was due, it said that they were not quite as sort of uh, destructive in their pillaging and that they didn't destroy things. They just went through and found things that they thought would look really great in Venice and put them on their boats to take back. Yes, they very carefully like take statues and wrap them and like put them in crates because yeah. they, unlike, you know, you could argue that unlike the sort of pillaging Franks, they are counting every penny and trying to make as much money from this as they possibly can. I mean, there's a, there's a great quote, um, from a, they sort of, they heap this huge pile of treasure in the center of the city. And one of the crusaders describes it as so great that none could tell you the end of it. Gold and silver and vessels and precious stones and samite and cloth of silk and robes fair and gray and ermine and every choicest thing found upon the earth. And so this millennia-long heritage of the Roman and the ancient world and centuries-long tradition of Christianity, basically all of it was kind of eradicated. It was gone. Yeah. And they also, even after they've left, they destroy the Roman state. Yeah. So they, they install their own emperor, who declares the Latin Empire of Constantinople, um, which is basically just Constantinople and its environs. They chop up other parts of the empire for their own little feudal kingdoms, which has the hugely destructive um, effect of breaking down um, the millennia-old Roman state and the art and the, the the basic architecture of administration that had been keeping it all running for again for millennia, and they just sort of come in and break all that down and just impose their own sort of Western feudal yeah. system on the people of Constantinople and the rest of the Roman Empire. And they change the official religion to Catholicism and brutally, brutally suppress Greek Orthodox Christians. Yeah. And as can be expected, there was a massive, massive exodus of Romans from Constantinople. There were 
basically all of the scholars left. Well, many of them to Italy. Many of them to Italy, where they were actually instrumental in sort of kicking off the artistic movement known as the Renaissance. Um, so there's a small sort of added benefit, I guess. But basically the displacement, even people that stayed, you know, were essentially left homeless. And not just the city, but the empire was ravaged. Now, this isn't the end of the story, because you may have noticed that we are still about 250 years away from Mehmed. So it's worth saying that they do, at this point, manage... After about 60 years, the Latin Empire is defeated. It basically starts crumbling as yeah. soon as it started. And they do sort of... The, the Romans do manage to stitch their, their state back together. But there, there's no coming back from this. Like, Constantinople is a ruined shell. Yeah. They're, the Like, the, even the palaces of the emperor are crumbling. Yeah let alone the homes of ordinary people. And so they have to just, they find themselves, this great civilization that once sort of ruled the world, eking out this sort of agricultural existence within the, within the walls of Constantinople. And even though in theory they managed to sort of rebuild the, the sort of the, their territory over the course of the 13th century, the wealth is gone. The administrative capacity to actually like rule the territory is gone. It's on, a, on an unbelievably shaky foundation. Yeah, over the course of the subsequent two or so centuries, the population slowly declines, the economy declines, things aren't great. They manage, the empire manages to sort of eke out an existence basically by playing different factions off against each other. They'll ally with Turkish warlords one day, and then with the Seljuk Shahs in Iran the next day. But no, nobody's taking them seriously anymore. Especially because less than a century after the Romans retake Constantinople in the 1260s, what happens then? The Black Plague. <laughs> it's like stepping on a banana peel and falling and then having a, a bucket land on your head or I something. Than that, it's like stepping on a banana peel and falling directly into like an industrial threshold. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But it's worth mentioning that although there are attempts to take Constantinople by siege by other armies, Constantinople still, over the subsequent couple of centuries, does not fall again. They are still Romans, and these are still the Roman walls. So, the Fourth Crusade was kind of the culmination of the threats to Rome from the West playing out, but we mentioned before that there were threats from the East as well. So how did those play out? Well, that's going to be an entire extra, that's going to be an entirely separate podcast episode. So at the of start, of, you are not um, prepared the for the places century. this is going to go. If there you think, a, if you think this Turkish was huge and sweeping and Osman. like... Osman was mystical in love with and a dramatic girl and chaotic. From the city of Eshkin. This is all the appetizer. <laughs> <laughs> this is the boring Osman bit. Osman had a dream. Before we get to the fun he dreamt stuff. that he was lying on his back. But anyway, and enough, a great tree enough, uh, grew out of his navel. Enough prevaricate. And then he looked up, he watched, he looked at the tree. He watched its sword shaped leaves flutter in the breeze. And then suddenly, the winds changed. And all the leaves were pointing in one direction. And he looked. He looked in the way that the leaves were pointing. And he saw the city of Constantinople. Osman would go on to be the founder of the Osmanolu, the ruling dynasty of a country that we now call the Ottoman Empire. <laughs> So we will leave Osman there, and we will leave the we will leave the Romans, and all all the other characters who we've met along the way, um, but we'll see them again 
in two weeks' time, we're going to tell uh, about tell we're, sorry, we're going to tell you about the last days of Constantinople, and the the utterly implausible but unbelievably real story of how the city falls. So thank you so much once again for listening to this episode of the Weird Medieval Guys podcast. This has been a long time in the making, obviously. And I'm so, so happy, uh, Olivia, that you have you have come along with me and, and gone with this and really embraced the, the absolute brain rot that I have. <laughs> what can I say? I was having this dream one night about <laughs> a podcast microphone growing from my navel. <laughs> and it pointed in a direction, and I looked. So, yeah, thank you so much for listening. Thank you so much as well for over 400 reviews on Spotify. With an average review of... Five stars, baby! Whoop, whoop. Yeah, I mean, it's... it's it's getting... I'm sounding like a broken record at this point, but it is it is genuinely amazing. Yeah, we love you guys. Um, we're so grateful for you, and if you enjoy our podcast and haven't left a review yet on Spotify or the platform of your choice, we would love it if you did so. And you can also give us feedback on Spotify through the what did you think of this episode box. And if your thoughts are particularly poignant or entertaining, we may read them out loud on the podcast like we're about to do now. So this this one comes to us from our from our most recent episode about, well, our Q&A episode. Uh, from Louise, who says, I love your show. It's informative and funny. Thank you. I also have a review from Sebastian, who says, Where is my episode about Constantinople? Is this. This is it. Enjoy. You got it. Well, you got half of it. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, this has been a... This has been a really fun one to record, and I, I cannot wait to show you what we have in store. It's... It's got the next episode that we're going to do is, I think you'll agree with me, is not like anything else we've ever done. Absolutely not. It's completely mad. <laughs> but let's not tell on ourselves too much. You tease. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you. <laughs> Actually, next episode is going to be boring and lame. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Um, social media handles. I am at. Aaron P. Tapper is on Twitter and at Aaron on Blue Sky. And I am at Weird Medieval on Twitter for Weird Medieval Guys, but I'm also um, on as Olivia underscore underscore MS for uh, my personal account. You're also on TikTok now. I'm also on TikTok now, and I do post about the one thing that everyone wants to know about, foraging for plants <laughs> to use in natural dyeing. <laughs> God, you're not like other girls. I'm much, much weirder. <laughs>